Hello, everyone. Welcome to one of the last sessions of the IEEST conference. Um, it looks like we have a smaller audience today. I imagine it's been a long day for everyone. So uh, we should end this session a little early. Um, we're going to have four presentations focused on electric vehicles and battery technologies. Um, each talk will be about 10 minutes. Um, and then we'll have five minutes of Q&A directly following each talk. And then at the end, I'll wrap up the session. So we're going to start off uh, this session with a talk from Dr. Hung Kuo Kim. Uh, Megan, if you can bring him onto the podium with me. Um, Dr. Kim is a research scientist at the Research and Innovation Center at Ford Motor Company in Dearborn, Michigan. His research interests cover a wide range of vehicle related LCAs and circular economy topics such as light weighting materials, second use EV batteries, autonomous vehicles and shared mobility. Dr. Kim, it's all yours. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, it looks perfect. Okay. Right. Uh, thank you, Chairman. So, uh, as you know, the driverless autonomous vehicles um, will be the future of uh, personal mobility. And there are a number of exciting features and concerns around autonomous vehicles. Um, I listed a few uh, potential uh, impacts of autonomous vehicles, uh, perhaps relevant to the current um, topic. So AVs are <laughs> disruptive technology and their large scale adoption will have a profound social, economic and environmental impacts. AVs can facilitate shared mobility, which may reduce vehicle lifetime and fleet size due to the uh, intensive use of uh, uh, vehicles. Autonomous vehicles, if electrified, can facilitate uh, wireless charging and V2G integration which may relieve EV range restrictions and anxieties. So this is uh, uh, the research question. What would be the potential uh, life cycle energy and GHG impacts of uh, generic shared electric uh, AV? So what would be the uh, energy impact of AVs in the use phase? So uh, listed here, are some potential energy impact of autonomous vehicles in the literature. Um, there are a wide range of both positive and negative uh, impacts. Um, these impacts can be uh, categorized into direct operational effects uh, versus indirect system effects. Uh, direct operational effects um, include eco driving or play tuning and so on, which related to vehicle efficiency change. Indirect um, system effects um, are uh, related to ride sharing and, and convenience, uh, driving convenience, um, you know, which will uh, induce more or less BMT, vehicle miles traveled. And um, recently we added the uh, um, impact of uh, sensors and computers um, are needed in autonomous vehicles um, in the literature at, at the bottom of this graph. So the goal of current studies incorporate these effectors in vehicle life cycle assessments, uh, which is uh, challenging due to complexity of these factors. Um, despite these uh, challenges in our previous study, we published um, first LCA of connected uh, AVs with the University of Michigan. By analyzing these factors, we employed a multiple level analysis to account for the uh, impacts. The first in the CAV level, um, CAV sensor level, uh, we uh, took into account the cradle to get impact of subsystems such as uh, radar, LIDAR, computer, and sonar. And we also, um, included the uh, power demand to operate uh, those subsystem equipment. And finally, we added a weight and aerodynamic impact. And in, this, in the level of uh, vehicle direct effects, uh, we incorporated uh, vehicle efficiency change due to eco-driving, platooning, and um, uh, highway speed uh, you know, in, the, uh, in the autonomous driving. And finally, uh, in the level of uh, 
system indirect effects. Um, actually, we did not include these effects uh, because since it is in uh, indirect effects, there is additional modeling needed to incorporate into vehicle ACs. And this is the summary of our uh, first LCA result published in uh, ESNT. So starting from uh, baseline non CAV vehicle from left, if we add uh, AV subsystem effects, such as from sensors and computers, um, we have around 3% increases in GHG emissions or uh, energy consumption. Uh, but if you add uh, uh, direct operational effect from uh, eco driving and V2I and so on, uh, we found the net benefits will be a 7 to 9 percent reduction. Uh, however, we did not um, include the effect of uh, electrified uh, autonomous vehicles because of difficulties in data gathering and modeling. In the current study, uh, we are uh, investigating the uh, electrified autonomous vehicles benefits. So in this graph, we compared um, direct operational impact, uh, such as eco-driving and V2I impact between uh, ICV and BEB. Uh, we were using physics model and a simulation tool called FASIM, developed, developed by NREL. Um, as you see in this graph, connected eco-driving can save uh, energy up to 25% depending on driving conditions, uh, such as degree of congestion. Um, as you see in this graph from left to right, more energy savings found in the congested uh, driving conditions. Uh, BPHC represent the uh, Beijing peak hour cycle. So BPHC saves much more uh, fuels than the condition of highway driving as you see in this graph. Um, we also found that um, electrified autonomous vehicle saves much less than uh, uh, internal combustion engine autonomous vehicles because EV is already uh, very efficient uh, by utilizing uh, electric motor and regenerative, regenerative braking. So there's not much room to improve. And we also confirmed that our analysis is consistent with a recent DOE smart mobility report, as you see in the right side of the graph. And another area of uncertainty uh, that we want to um, illustrate is the, uh, the subsystem automation load. So the uh, radar, LIDAR, and computers need the uh, automation power uh, to operate. So here we plotted the uh, um, automation power versus energy consumption in uh, AV. The top row represents um, gasoline vehicles, and the bottom row corresponds to uh, better electric vehicles. From left to right, uh, each column represent a uh, different speed range or congestion level and uh, middle uh, horizontal uh, light blue line represent the uh, uh, baseline non, uh, non-AV operation. So as you see in this graph, uh, AV benefits can be very high in congested area in the first column. Um, but also the, the graph shows that uh, there is a potential uh, risk of energy uh, increase if automation load is uh, very high, like 1,000 or 2,000 watt. Okay, all in all, um, uh, we found that to save autonomous vehicle energy consumption, the automation load needs to be below one kilowatt. Finally, in this study, we were, all, we were able to uh, incorporate the, one of the indirect effects of a shared SAEV, uh, which is the uh, EV range resizing. So in the literature, um, shared EAV fluid can relieve um, EV range anxiety and reduce battery size when combined with smart and wireless charging, but um, there were no uh, quantified estimates. So we estimated the life cycle GHG benefits of reducing uh, EV range and, and EV battery size. Uh, what's interesting here is that um, 
when you reduce battery size, there's a feedback cycle. Uh, for example, in, uh, in the left side uh, column, if you reduce battery size, there's EV mass will go down, but because of the mass reduction, EV mile per gallon will uh, improve and EV range also will improve. That means there's additional room to reduce more battery. And this type of feedback cycle continues um, uh, infinitely. And we also found secondary mass reduction is feasible by reducing uh, uh, EV battery size. So by uh, incorporating all the um, factors, we found that, for example, by reducing EV range from 300 to 200 mile, the life cycle GHG and energy uh, will uh, be reduced by about 10%. So in this summary, um, this waterfall chart illustrates um, how uh, a shared EAV can save or increase life cycle GHG emissions. Starting from um, left side non-AV, uh, if we add subsystem effects, GHG emissions will uh, increase about uh, eight units, which is about 3%. But uh, if you add a direct operational impacts, um, uh, the GHG emission will be uh, reduced by about 6%. Finally, if we add the battery resizing effect, uh, the uh, uh, GHG emission will further reduced by 10%, resulting in uh, a total reduction of about 13%. Uh, yeah, this uh, preliminary uh, study result shows that EV battery resizing could be uh, potentially another important benefits of uh, shared EAB, which is not well covered by the current literature. Yep, this is a work in progress, uh, a lot of moving parts and uncertainties uh, around the subsystem and battery uh, technologies and impacts. They need to, be, need to be updated when data become available. This is summary. Uh, autonomous vehicle can reduce life cycle GHG emissions during uh, operational stage, but subsystem automation load, if exceeds 100 kilowatt, may offset those benefits. Uh, AV's direct operational benefits uh, decrease when uh, combined with electric powertrain. Shared EAB may allow uh, further reducing EV range and battery size, uh, which may lead to uh, significant reductions in life cycle GHG and EV battery material uses. This is a work in progress for the investigations uh, needed to reduce uh, uncertainties and uh, update technology progress. Okay, thank you very much. I'm ready to yeah, take some questions. We'll do a virtual clap here. Great presentation. You can go ahead and stop sharing your presentation so everyone can see your face again. Um, I'll open it up to the floor and if anyone has a question, um, and Megan, if you can maybe add a second podium and people can join if they would like to and ask a question in person or you can ask a question down in the question box down below. Um, maybe while we're waiting for audience questions, I'll ask a question of my own to get started. Um, a key factor in reducing emissions you mentioned was reducing the electric vehicle range from 300 miles to 200 miles. Um, do you have any sense of how feasible this is? I, I mean, one of the large limitations of getting electric vehicles adopted is range anxiety. So my concern with that result is that people are less likely to adopt the electric vehicles in the first mm -hmm. place if yep. their range is reduced. Yep, that's a good question. Yeah, so if you drive a private uh, EV, yeah, there will be definitely anxiety. But if you don't have to drive and just uh, uh, rely on the, uh, you know, autonomous system, then we definitely will have, uh, you know, confidence. Yep, uh, probably <laughs> you know, the autonomous will will take take care of the um, any issues of, uh, you know, uh, charging or battery uh, leakage, right? So that's one factor. Another factor here is that uh, I didn't mention probably, but it's, it's a kind, some kind of fleet um, operation is uh, assumed in this uh, uh, assessment. So that means there's a, some kind of uh, 
um, you know, uh, ride sharing company like Uber and Lyft, they, uh, the autonomous vehicles um, communicate each other uh, to find, uh, you know, the best charging stations, first of all, available stations to you know, minimizing waiting time and so on, right? And also, if you one vehicle is not available to pick up passengers, that the other vehicles may uh, be available to pick up that passengers uh, by communicating, um, you know, efficiently. So it's uh, uh, a little bit complicated, but uh, it's uh, combined the benefits of uh, um, autonomous communication and uh, fleet level uh, optimization. Yeah. So that's the. Uh, you know, basic assumptions behind, yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so that definitely makes yeah, sense. Uh, this is one of the examples that we do not know exactly how much um, mileage, you, you know, uh, EV range you can save at this point, so, yeah. Okay, perfect. Does anyone in the audience have any questions? Um, hi. Uh, yeah, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I just had a question in slide eight when you showed the percent reduction when you change the vehicle mile mileage. Uh, can you specify these values or for what year exactly? I'm not sure if you did mention this, but uh, for what year are these reductions obtained for? Right. Okay, I have to share my screen again, I guess. So can you tell me which slide eight? Slide eight. Okay, okay. Yeah. What's your what's your question? Yeah. For what year are you seeing these reductions? I'm not sure if you did mention this or not, but let me get that. These reductions in GHG emissions mm -hmm. are considered for what year? Like when you consider, for example, with time, you have technological developments, et cetera, et cetera, you would expect that this, these figures would be changing. So basically, for what uh, year are you considering these values? Well, this, this uh, uh, the numbers here is based on the grid model, uh, 2020, uh, 2019 with 2020 grid model. So for the year average US sedan um, battery electric vehicle. So all of these numbers are, you know, uh, extrapolated their um, battery size and and you know, and uh, their uh, power trend and collider impact. So which is uh, which means that this is. Uh, for the current technology, it's not the future technology, actually. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, if there's not any other questions, I think we're going to move on to the next presentation. Thank you again for sharing your presentation with us. It was very interesting. Thank you. Next up, we're going to have a presentation from Ian Miller. Uh, Ian Miller is a research specialist, research specialist, excuse me, at the MIT Energy Initiative. His research focus is modeling energy systems with a focus on passenger vehicles. Uh, today, he's going to present on the electri electrification pathways for passion passenger cars. Sorry, I'm stumbling all over my words. If you want to go ahead and share your screen, Ian. Thank you very much. I'll do that right now. Okay, let me bring up my slides. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you and I can see a lot of pictures of myself. In an infinite mirror loop. Yep. <laughs> um, but hold on. Okay, so I'll be talking about the Sesame fleet model uh, being developed at MIT's Energy Initiative, where I research. Sesame stands for Sustainable Energy System and Modeling Environment, which is a mouthful. I uh, think it's just uh, fun to say Open Sesame because it is a software web platform. So today we're going to use Sesame to look at some electrification pathways for passenger cars. And the contents will include Brief motivation, I'll go through that quickly. Uh, and then some Sesame use case examples. Um, EV growth rates and emissions, batteries and power grids, and some resource constraints. I don't think in nine minutes um, 
we'll get to everything, which is fine. Charging patterns and grids, uh, clearly too ambitious here. And then a couple takeaways. Why do we care about electrification pathways for passenger car fleets? One is to lower GHG emissions. Um, two is because light duty vehicle fleets economics and policies are changing fast. For example, California's proposed ICE sales ban for 2035, Iceland's proposed ban for 2025, um, General Motors' uh, tentative plan to sell um, all zero emission vehicles by 2035. And number three for motives, government utilities and power grid operators need uh, advice on how to manage EV growth in the future. Existing fleet models lack some important features which Sesame uh, has tried to develop. I'm not gonna dwell on this table it just enumerates some of the features that Sesame has and some of the features that are missing in one colleague um, fleet model, which is Argonne National Lab's vision uh, car fleet model for the US. But there are others out there, so this is by no means exhaustive. A use case to start with is that Sesame can show different regions, right? And we see the United States here, and we'll look at these figures for different regions and different other variables of interest. So let me take a minute to explain them. Um, the upper left, we're looking at car sales in millions of cars. The x-axis for all of these figures is year, divided into past and future, and the y-axis depends on the figure, of course. Here for car sales, we segment by powertrain. So some of us know this, some don't. I, I wanna make sure this is accessible. Real quick, fuel cell, electric vehicles, battery, electric vehicles in green, plug-in hybrids like the Prius Prime in yellow, pure hybrids like the Prius hatchback in orange, uh, diesel cars and gasoline cars in black. Um, that's the first figure. The second figure is the fleet size itself, the stock of cars on the road, also in millions. You can see, you know, order 10 bigger than sales. Third is the fuel use in a common unit of terawatt hours here for this scenario dominated by gasoline use in the US. Uh, important disclaimer is we're not claiming this first use case is the most likely projection for the future. This is the annual energy outlooks uh, sales projection for the United States as a input to our Sesame model, which then generates these other three figures. The fourth figure last but not least is greenhouse gas emissions in million metric tons of CO2 equivalent. And one interesting thing to highlight is that, you know, the recession of 08, 09 in the US had a uh, dramatic 40% impact on annual car sales over a couple of years. This is not unusual for recessions if you go back into previous decades. So when we look at these projections, uh, it's important to note that we're not modeling hard to predict cyclical downturns, right? Think of this as a seven year average or something similar in terms of the long-term trends. Okay, so different regions. Uh, California, a subregion of the US, has a similar uh, trajectory to the US, that similar uh, recession dip. Texas, similar but different, meaning Texas has long term population growth superimposed on that recession impact, so that you see the dip uh, on a percent basis was much lower and you see this long-term growth in car sales per person, along with the fleet and emissions. 
and to step outside the U.S. for a second, important not to to limit our uh, field, we see Norway is dramatically different. Um, right here, uh, Sesame allows easy toggling uh, between you know, unit views and share views. And that can help us underline just how dramatically Norway has changed in the last 10 years from roughly 98% ICE market share a decade ago to um, this, uh, to, you know, less than 50% today. And actually, I, I think, you know, this, this trend has dramatically has uh, maintained so that if we had 2020 in here, it would be um, higher EV sales than this arbitrary projection you see here. Um, moving forward to different sales as opposed to different regions, we already talked about AEO for a minute. Also wanted to show the range of projections out there. Of course, the future is uncertain and uh, Bloomberg has significantly higher projections for EV sales. I would note that uh, that doesn't mean Bloomberg is unrealistic or too aggressive. If you look at the last four or five years, uh, like AEO, Bloomberg has under projected um, EV sales every single year, obviously by much less, but nonetheless under projection. So it's entirely plausible that a higher EV growth case could, you know, occur, especially if bans start to gain momentum in certain places, or if uh, EV and battery prices drop more uh, dramatically than than Bloomberg expects. Uh, key thing to highlight here is that the sales input is Bloomberg, but we've stuck with the AEO power grid projection. Of course, you can argue that is not valid, right? We should be united in the uh, projection source. So if you instead switch to uh, something closer to, to Bloomberg's and the exact number is proprietary, but uh, definitely uh, much lower than AEOs for the carbon intensity of the power grid, you can see this non-trivial impact on the car fleet's total emissions. Um, Last but not least, the ice ban scenario, right? Uh, this is obviously extreme for the entire United States. You could argue it's it's more realistic to model something like this for the California region, um, which Sesame can do, and for, for any region, really. So it depends on your interest. And uh, Massachusetts has also announced consideration of a 2035 um, ice sales ban. So. You can see, you know, going from the lowest sale uh, EV sales projection, keeping our eye on the bottom right for car emissions, the drop in total emissions is major, um, order of 70, 80%. Okay. Um, I think this will be uh, the last topic uh, for discussion, and it is the impact of electric vehicle growth on lithium-ion batteries and power grids in the U.S. Uh, right now we have, uh, sorry, right here we have a case um, similar to Bloomberg's uh, slightly uh, lower uh, electric vehicle sales, and the estimated impact on battery demand uh, by these EVs in the US. Uh, let's put some context on this number. We're looking at roughly 900 gigawatt hours of lithium ion batteries um, and world battery production uh, for 2019 was about 200. Right, so we're talking four times today's lithium battery production. And McKinsey has projected roughly 3,000 gigawatt hours in 2030. 
And so, you know, this is only one third of a 2030s world projection by McKinsey. Um, there are other ways to, to analyze that demand and whether it's, it's resource constrained. Uh, but I also want to highlight um, Sesame's ability to estimate the actual batteries on the road, right, in those cars, because as our uh, previous presenter mentioned, um, EVs have significant V2G potential. And to analyze that, you, you, of course, first have to quantify just how many batteries are out there in those cars. Uh, if you look here, you see around 11 terawatt hours of batteries on the road by mid-century. To put that in context, if you slow charged all of those batteries, right, over six hours, that would give you about two terawatts of power capacity, which is double uh, the U.S. grid's capacity today. The, the claim here is not that 100% of that capacity will ever be used in a, a vehicle to grid scenario. It's just that that is massive. And if you want to do frequency regulation, for example, for the power grid, you only need a tiny, tiny fraction of these two terawatt hours to participate. So to me, that, that seems like a business case problem. Um, the, the technology and the resource will be there in, in any high EV future. Uh, then as you move up the, um, the duration uh, of application to uh, say peak shaving of power demand in the evenings, this two terawatt hours is still quite uh, significant. You're still gonna need significantly less than that to, to um, reduce peaks in uh, average evenings. Seasonal energy storage, no. But peak shaving in day to day, two terawatt, two terawatts can um, do a lot of damage. Figure C here is showing fuel use in this scenario. And just to quantify the yellow, right? That's EV power demand. And that's about 20% of all power generation today. And the, the takeaway here is that you, you can't avoid the question of what power plants are satisfying this power demand. Uh, you need to grid, you need to model grid fleet interaction. And, and that brings us back to uh, the vision fleet model and uh, many fleet models out there um, assume identical power grids between different EV scenarios, right? So they look at a, you know, a low EV case and a high EV case and treat the the power grid and the power grid's uh, carbon emission intensity as a constant. And you can't, you can't do that. If you really want to estimate the emissions impact of this giant growth in grid power demand, you need to estimate or at least specify where that power might come from. Um, last but not least, and I think, I think my time is uh, running out here. Brendan, is that correct? Uh, okay. Anyway, um, the percent recycled. Yes. Sorry. Okay. Yes. The time is up. So go ahead and wrap up on Great. this topic and then we'll move into some questions. Great. Thanks a lot. Um, this point D is important. We care about emissions, of course, greenhouse gas emissions, but we don't want to play whack-a-mole with environmental impacts. So we need to quantify the outflow of batteries from these EVs as they retire. You see here because of the non-steady state by mid-century, it's still only you know, a third of the batteries actually on the road, but um, you got to ask yourself what percent of those are recycled versus landfill versus going to second life applications on, on power grids. And uh, I'll end there. So thanks a lot and happy to, to hear any questions. Interesting presentation. Uh, I think this tool can definitely be insightful. You can go ahead and stop sharing your screen so okay. we can see you. Um, I'll open the floor to any questions. It doesn't look like we had any come in during the talk. So uh, while people are thinking of their questions, I'll go ahead and start and 
Uh, the first obvious question I wanted to ask is, uh, is the Sesame model available for people to use? Is it open source or is it just something within MIT right now? Um, open source eventually and available to the world eventually. That's a key word, but we have a uh, beta going now and a plan to release a public version uh, in August at the absolute latest. Our, our internal goal is July, but uh, you know how these things go. And uh, at the latest, everyone in this room and uh, you know their, their uh, colleagues can have access to uh, these, uh, this tool and generate their own um, scenarios for you know, many regions. Perfect, and is it only passenger vehicles? Does it do fleet or um, heavy duty vehicles as well? Um, for now, it's only passenger for transportation, uh, as the you know Sesame name the the system suggests. There's uh, also a, a power model that's linked to this uh, passenger car fleet model, right? As I was uh, claiming, you, you, it's important to model those interactions. And uh, Sesame, more broadly, um, in, allows both pathway views, right? Perhaps you want to compare individual cars side by side on their life cycle emissions. Uh, with with classic bar charts, or perhaps you're more interested in the fleet systems view, and and Sesame offers both, but not okay. heavy duty yet. Right. Okay, that's good to know. Is there any questions from the audience? Go ahead and join the podium if you'd like to ask a question. I'll give it a couple awkward seconds here. Can I? Um... I have one question. If, yep, go ahead. Yeah, what's the um, survival rates you're using? Any models? I don't survival, any, sorry. Yeah, any, it's not easy to find a very reliable uh, survival model right now. There was some, some kind of uh, NHTSA model, but it's kind of outdated, like 2010 model, what before that? So, any uh, lifetime uh, estimation? In your... Right. Um, so, Right now, our uh, survival uh, assumption for um, today's cars is around uh, 17 years for their average lifetime. Of course, we, we model a distribution. Um, and if you want to model today, you need to model car sales from you know a decade and two decades ago. That's that's just historical uh, uh, data. You know, eleven years was the average lifetime of of cars in the seventies. Now it's uh, you know reached seventeen. We model that as a static average into the future, um, but a uh, fair argument could be made that it will continue to rise, uh, mm -hmm. and the user can play with those lifetime assumptions. Mm -hmm. Uh, in Sesame, not just the average lifetime, but also how quickly the um, annual mileage of an average car declines. We all know it declines with age, but that has actually changed pretty pretty majorly mm -hmm. in the last thirty years. And you know, your presentation talked about you know distance per car potentially rising due to autonomy's mm -hmm. growth. Mm -hmm. So it's important to be able to to, to model that. Thank you. Great. Thanks for the question. Uh, I think we're now going to move on to the next presentation. So thank you, Ian, for giving that presentation on Sesame. That was very interesting. Our next presenter is going to be... Thank you, Braden. Yep, no problem. Uh, our next presenter is going to be Amir Safari. Amir Safari is a PhD student in the Environmental Systems Program under the advisory of Dr. Uh, Fortier. He previously earned a master's degree in mechanical engineering at the Belkinge Institute of Technology in Sweden. He has years of experience designing and manufacturing piezoelectric technology through a research project called Energy Harvesting from Road Traffic, supervised by Dr. Juan Kuo Sun, using the knowledge gained through this ongoing ongoing project, Amir is developing life cycle assessment models of piezoelectric 
technology which transform mechanical energy in a form of vibration of vehicles into electricity. Looks like we have Amir here. Hello, all. Hello. Do you want to go ahead and share your slides? I'll make sure they're working right. Okay, I see your presentation. Oh, there it goes. Now okay. it's in presenter mode. You're good to go. Um, actually, this is a little bit different. I want to interest, introduce the uh, a new uh, um, technology, piezoelectric energy harvesting system, and also uh, uh, show the result of the evaluation. This system actually was developed in the University of California. Uh, Merced and uh, uh, the project funded by California Energy Commission. Uh, the natural resources uh, actually uh, har uh, the, by harnessing the natural resources, uh, we are renewable energy application like uh, solar energy or wind energy. Uh, we can. Um, decrease the greenhouse gas emissions. Also, by diversifying renewable energy supplies, we can increase energy security and also uh, I guarantee availability of the electricity. One of these uh, uh, emerging technology is the piezoelectric energy harvesting system. This uh, piezoelectric is a material that can generated electricity when uh, deforming uh, by uh, like compression or extension. Uh, you can see some of the application that uh, uh, made by piezoelectric in the past. Uh, in our pr project, actually, um, let me see, I have a window here. In our project, our, uh, you can see the concept in the uh, animation. In our project, uh, we try to uh, harvest the energy from the road. Uh, in this system, the weight of the car actually uh, deform the piezoelectric to generate the electricity. And we can fit the grid or charge the car in the stations by this system. Um, the uh, advantage of this system is that we have a high load density uh, and we can uh, generate a significant amount of the electricity. Uh, this is the uh, some picture of our project. Uh, we already made the pilot scale system. Uh, this is the generator, this cylinder. And uh, now I, here I... I tested in the uh, instant machine. Uh, in the here we actually uh, make them water made them waterproof for installing under the ground and you can see the layer layout and <clears throat> here the car are actually standing on the system. The, Sinking displacement is uh, about a one a less than one centimeter, and the uh, uh, driver uh, almost feel nothing when pass uh, on the system. When passing on the system, um, for evaluation, I did the life cycle assessment. Uh, my goal was that uh, uh, estimate the total climate change impact. Also, uh, we want to determine which process contribute the most greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, with this information, uh, actually, we uh, optimize the system and our design to make it less uh, impact, uh, like to the uh, uh, to the environment. Uh, I used the pilot uh, scale system. Uh, to collect the data and uh, um, evaluate the, uh, and evaluate the environmental impact of the uh, piezoelectric and generator and adopt it to four commercial scales to uh, uh, evaluate them. Actually, this uh, 
energy system highly the performance of this energy system uh, in, highly depends on the location we chose uh, actually four location busy highway busy downtown uh, street remote area highway and remote zone in the mountain to uh, uh, as a location to evaluate the system the purpose of this uh, to provide the electricity for light and electrical equipment on highway charging a station in remote areas uh, supporting grid throughout the peak demand and having electricity during a natural disaster like storms uh, you can see the features of the each uh, uh, system uh, So for uh, doing the life cycle assessment, there is no uh, uh, impact uh, inventory for the PZT. So at first I did the PZ, uh, LCA on PZT, piezoelectric stack. The uh, impact is uh, the climate change impact is around uh, between 13, 14 kilogram CO2 equivalent per kilogram of the PZT. After that, uh, uh, I just um, did the LCA on the generator, uh, which you can see here in the picture. Uh, the climate change impact of the generator is 134 gram CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hours. I actually uh, choose the, uh, the load uh, which here I simulate is like the typical highway, not the busy highway. Uh, and this is the system diagram of the whole uh, system, which uh, in this system we assume uh, that this system would only be installed when a road require replacement or a new road must be constructed. With this assumption, uh, we have it actually beside the electricity, we have the byproduct of the pavement. And because of that, we define the co-product and the services, which is the maintenance of the road. And uh, you will see the result of the next page. Uh, this co-product and services, uh, actually de uh, we deal with this, uh, uh, them with the six system expansion method. Uh, this is the result of the LCA. Uh, you see with the co-product, um, uh, mm, mm, with accounting the co-product, uh, the busy highway is around 121. Uh, the busy downtown street is around 140. And the rest is uh, a little bit higher, for example. Um, no co-products co actually means that we dig the uh, good condition road and uh, install the uh, system on that, which is not uh, recommended. In terms of the sectors, um, production uh, uh, process has the most uh, contribution in the uh, a car carbon emissions and you can see the advantage of the co-products and recycling to reduce the impacts this is an emerging uh, technology so uh, there are a uh, lots of uncertainty and uh, uh, vari variability uh, which we have the assumption so with sensitivity uh, analysis we understand the, uh, the like behavior of the systems better for example uh, like a uh, influence of the lifetime or a number of the cars which one is uh, for example uh, uh, which uh, with changing we can reduce the impacts or some uncertainties we, we have no idea about the maintenance in future or for example uh, uh, many, many, uh, even the lifetime. So we did the sensitivity analysis. Also, uh, uh, for the for the 
better comparison and making the range we did the Monte Carlo analysis with 10,000 simulation. In this, uh, we, we, uh, we, with this analysis, we actually can uh, find the range for each uh, scenario. You can see here, uh, for example, and also uh, for a, a better comparison, I put the uh, impact, average impact of the uh, generating electricity with the natural gas and coal in the uh, figure. You can see that uh, uh, still the impact of the systems, the uh, uh, carb carbon footprint of the system is lower than the natural gas and coal. And uh, is, uh, um, for example, busy highway has a, a good performance actually. One of the uh, like uh, most uh, concern about this technology is uh, is that belief that vehicles may consume more fuel on a softer road. Uh, actually, we could not calculate this uh, more fuel. It should be few persons if it exists. But what I did is I. Um, uh, actually define the permissible range. This In this range, for example, I found that uh, for busy highway scenario, if the vehicle consumes up to 0 0.076 gallons per mile, more than driving on the regular road, they generate uh, the uh, still the generated electricity will uh, be lower than impact of electricity generated from the national gas. So this is what I can find. Mm. Uh, but I'm not sure even uh, this is exist. Uh, but uh, uh, this this range show me that if, if past this, uh, this range, then uh, the result will be worse than the natural gas on fossil fuel. However, uh, by um, in the future, by using the electrical vehicle, uh, this problem maybe is is uh, reduced. We, uh, will be reduced, I think. So, in conclusion of this evaluation, I uh, can say that um, <coughs> piezoelectric actually uh, our energy harvesting system may have a lower climate change impact than fossil fuels if we chose a, a, a proper location, which this uh, the most in fact, uh, like uh, important factor is uh, choose the busy streets, which uh, help us to generate more electricity. Also, also the, uh, this system should be or you know, have to install in the uh, only when a road must be replaced or built. Uh, it should, uh, it must not uh, install on the road with the good condition. Uh, thank you uh, for listening. Uh, uh, if I'm ready, if you have any questions. Great, thank you so much for this interesting presentation, Amir. Uh, do we have any questions? Um, I don't see any from the audience in the chat box. If anyone has one, feel free to join us on the podium. Amir, you can stop sharing your screen now so we can see you. Um, I have one question for you just to start things off. Um, how much do these systems cost? Do you know if that's going to significantly increase the cost of the roadways and be more expensive than other power producing sources? Actually, um... The cost is less than the mm, mm, uh, I didn't do the uh, ben like cost benefit analysis, uh, but the cost is uh, um, a little more. But we will generate electricity, so there is some income. Uh, the cost is more than the road. Uh, so we will put a lot, especially PZT. PZT is a 
kind of expensive material, PZT piezoelectric, and but uh, with commer and um, they just using the sensors. So with the commercializing, uh, like uh, in the high volume, maybe the price is uh, reduced. But now it's kind of expensive system. Okay. Um, I may have missed this from your talk, but how long is the life of these systems? Do they have to be replaced more frequently than roadways or do they last? Oh, no, no, actually, uh, the, we, we actually design it for uh, 40 years, but in the evaluation, wow. in the, yeah, it's for 40 years. There is no, the system is not under any pressure or uh, like, uh, uh, it's under the pressure, but um, mm, Actually, we use the steel and we think it worked for 40 years. But uh, for the busy highway and busy streets, I uh, in the evalu evaluation, I uh, picked 30 years. <laughs> Interesting. So it'll last way so longer I, than roadways do. I couldn't. Uh, I couldn't. Uh, oh, yes. yes. Is there any other questions from the audience who want to join the podium? I guess it looks like we have one from Hank Coquin. <laughs> yeah, my name is uh, Hyung Chul. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. It just <laughs> sounded weird to me. <laughs> um, I, I almost put on my... Oh, yeah, my question was uh, about uh, any... Uh, uh, analysis and uh, energy payback time. So, in the in you know, when you invest a certain amount of uh, energy or greenhouse gas emissions, the system has to be paid back within like three or four years, more savings than invested, something like that. Then uh, it's you can uh, safely say it is, uh, you know, um, environmentally friendly. So, did you ever try that? Actually, uh, the, yeah, instead of energy impact, uh, like payback, I did the uh, LCA. So, uh, um, but I didn't, uh, I, that's a good call. I will, I uh, can uh, check that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah, good call. No, we didn't do that. That's a good okay. call. Yep. Yeah. Okay. We just do the LCA and check the carbon emission for now, like. Mm -hmm. yep. Thanks. Great. Thank you for your question. Okay. Uh, I think we're going to end the question and answer session there. So thank you again for your interesting thank presentation, you. Amir. I hope to uh, see this technology out on the road sometime soon. Thank you. Or maybe in my lifetime, at least. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. We have one remaining presentation in this session. Um, this presentation is by Micah Ziegler. Micah is a postdoctoral post associate in the Institute for Data Systems and Society at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he studies energy systems and technological change. Before coming to MIT, Micah earned a PhD in chemistry from the University of California, Berkeley, and a bachelor's in chemistry from Yale University. He also has research climate and energy policy at the World Resources Institute and was a loose scholar in Hong Kong, where he focused on helping businesses improve their environmental sustainability. Looks like we have Micah on the screen now. Hi, can you hear me? Yep, you sound great. Go ahead and great. show your slides. You should be able to see my slides now? Yep, it looks good. The stage is all yours. Thank you. So good evening, afternoon, or morning, depending on where you are. Uh, as Brayden mentioned, my name is Micah Ziegler. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Institute for Data Systems and Society at MIT. I currently study energy systems and technological change with an emphasis on energy storage technologies. Today, I would like to discuss some of the work I've conducted with my colleagues, Joe Song and Jessica Transick, to investigate the trends and determinants of the cost decline of lithium ion battery technologies. So in the short time that we have, I hope to introduce the idea of studying technological change and explain why we're studying the technological change specifically of lithium ion batteries. Then I want to 
describe some of our research that we actually published earlier this year on measuring the improvement in lithium ion technologies. And then I wanted to go into a bit more detail on how we're elucidating the determinants of lithium ion technology cost decline, going beyond the high level trends and trying to figure out really why the technology came down in cost. Finally, I would like to leave you with a few conclusions. So to start, why do we study technological change? So when I'm studying technological change, I'm trying to figure out what enables some technologies to succeed. Why are some technologies deployed widely while others never leave the lab? I'm really working to identify features of successful technologies and the processes that enable them that could be applied to a range of technologies. And ideally, we can apply these features or of successful technologies or processes to enable the improvement and deployment of climate friendly technologies. I'm trying to figure out, can we better direct research and development? Can we improve how we design public policies or inform investment strategies in an effort to really help accelerate the improvement of climate friendly technologies or nudge technological change in the direction of sustainability? So why am I studying lithium ion batteries? Well, they're already being used to electrify transportation and they're increasingly being used to integrate renewable energy resources into the broader electricity grid, but their costs remain high. So research into figuring out how their costs came down and how they might go down further in the future remains important in case we wanna further electrify transportation and integrate higher, concentrate, higher penetrations of renewable energy resources into the grid. Uh, they also appear to be a quickly improving technology. Here I'm showing that visually. On the left, there's a photo of one of the early cells that shuttled lithium ions back and forth to store energy in 1983. In the middle, you can see the first commercially available lithium ion cells produced by Sony. And then on the right in 2018, we have a large scale application of lithium ion technologies to a stationary storage system that provides services to the grid. And so while visually it looks like it's been rapidly improving, the quantitative estimates actually vary. For example, the learning rate, which is a measure of the relationship between historical cost or price and cumulative production. For lithium ion technologies, if you survey the literature, learning rates vary anywhere between 14 and 30%. And this is a pretty big deal because learning rates in this context are measured in the form of power laws. And so when you have a 14 to 30% difference, that's a really big difference in the estimate of how quickly a technology has improved. And it can drastically influence people's projections of how a technology might improve into the future. And so I'm hoping to figure out how quickly have lithium ion batteries actually improved, what led to this improvement and what can we learn to enable the further improvement of other energy storage technologies, as well as lithium ion technologies. I wanna figure out what researchers, policymakers, and businesses should do. So the first step is to actually measure the improvement in lithium ion technologies, try to find out whether it's closer to 14% or 30% for the learning rate. And so some of this work was published earlier this year, and a big portion of it was actually estimating the price decline of lithium ion technologies. We found that the price of lithium ion cells decreased by 97% between 1991 and 2018. We did this by harmonizing a large number of data series and point estimates of the cost of lithium ion technologies. We sought the original sources of the data, so that way we didn't rely too heavily on those data series that became popular. And we categorize these data. So in the plot shown here, in orange, you'll see data that refer to all types of lithium ion cells, be they cylindrical, prismatic, or pouch. But in dark blue, I'm highlighting those cells that are, sorry, I'm highlighting those data points that are specifically for cylindrical cells. And in both of these cases, we had enough data to develop a representative series. And you can see, based on the representative series, which are in uh, bold dashed lines, that there's a considerable difference between the prices of all types of lithium ion cells, estimates that cover the entire range, and those specific for cylindrical cells. And so you can actually find different rates when you, for example, measure the learning rate of these technologies. Uh, more details are available in the manuscript, and I'm happy to discuss them in the uh, question and answer period. And these trends are useful, especially when top-down studies of cost change and application of phenomenological models like 
Moore's Law, Wright's Law, and Goddard's Law. But I wanted to kind of dig deeper into what actually caused the trend. Why did this decrease in cost occur? And so that's what I'm talking about when I'm describing elucidating the determinants of lithium ion technology cost decline. Try to figure out what actually happened. And to do this, I'm applying an approach that's been developed in the Transic Lab. It's a dynamic bottom-up approach to cost change where you first develop a cost model. And here I'm actually showing a cost model for silicon photovoltaics because it's shorter and a little bit easier to walk through. But essentially we've taken the cost of a photovoltaic module in this case in dollars per watt and defined it as a function of various variables that represent technology features. For example, the solar cell efficiency or the price of silicon or the size of the manufacturing plant. And of course, the detail that you can put into your cost model depends on which features are important and which data you have. But once you have one of these cost models or cost equations, one can derive cost change equations. And these estimate a given variable's contribution to overall cost change. Because we're using discrete time points, we don't have continuous series. We have to employ a little bit of approximation. But once you do this, we essentially have the ability to disentangle the impacts of multiple simultaneous changes to a technology. So for the solar photovoltaic modules, we can kind of say this much of the cost reduction came from a change in the price of silicon, whereas this much came from an increase in the module efficiency. By starting with a cost change equation, we can lower the chance, chance of double counting various inputs, and the method can be used both retrospectively and prospectively. So I've applied it so far retrospectively to lithium ion technologies, specifically lithium ion cells, to see why their cost came down. Some results from that analysis are displayed here. I'm trying to essentially highlight low-level mechanisms of cost change. When I'm talking about a low-level mechanism, I'm describing a change in the variable, in the sorry, in a feature of the technology that resulted in a change in the cost of the technology. So, for example, the largest contribution we see to the decrease in cell cost between the late 1990s and early 2010s comes from a change in cell charge density. Essentially, all of the different uh, changes that went to increase cell charge density led to the biggest reduction in cost of a cell uh, between the two time points that we can analyze. The, and it turns out to be about 40% of the total cost change. Uh, the next largest contributor to the reduction in the price, or sorry, the cost of lithium ion batteries is cathode material prices. So this is, for example, the consequence of switching to lower cost first row transition metals and the uh, cathode material. This led to about 20% of the uh, declining cost of lithium ion cells. And the third largest contributor is plant size and plant size related characteristics. And what we can see here is that there are some very large factors. For example, the increase in cell charge density is a considerable contribution, but really the, there isn't one overwhelming factor. And there were many different contributors that were all significant contributors to the cost decline of lithium ion technologies. So the few conclusions I want to leave you with are, we actually were able to confirm in our analysis that lithium ion technologies are improving rapidly. In fact, they're improving at a rate comparable to that of solar photovoltaics, which are often held up as a gold standard of technological change in the space of renewable energy technologies. We then dove into what actually caused this cost change, why the technology improved, and we found that improved cell performance, mostly in terms of charge density, was the largest contributor to cost reduction, uh, and that lower cathode material prices and larger plant sizes were significant contributors, but were smaller. So going forward, what we can see based on the past at least is that no one cost reduction strategy did dominate previous cost decline, which suggests going forward that there might still be many avenues, many approaches that hold potential for future cost reduction. We also can see that methods that improve performance for a given amount of material, such as the increase in charge density observed, uh, might be especially promising because they, at least historically, have had a significant impact on the 
reduction in cost of lithium ion technologies. So hopefully these can provide insights for both the further improvement of lithium ion technologies as well as energy storage technologies more broadly. There are a lot of people who I have to thank for their contributions to this work, notably Professor Transick, my advisor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, my colleagues, Joe Song, Gokshin Kavlak, and James McNerney, who I've worked with to model cost trends and cost change, the entirety of the Transic Lab, as well as the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation and the Technology and Policy Program at MIT for funding. And so now I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Awesome, great presentation, Micah. That was extremely interesting. Uh, I'm always interested to see how new technologies are deployed and rolled out. Um, I didn't see any questions come through. Uh, it doesn't look like we have any questions in the chat either. So I'll ask a question first while people uh, can either join the podium or ask their own questions. Um, so most of your research focused on uh, understanding the cost decline. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So um, do you see that lithium new lithium on ion battery improvements in like charge speeds or lifespan or even something like recyclability is that something that you're seeing take place or is it pretty much only driven by a decrease in costs we're seeing lithium ion technologies improve along multiple dimensions and actually a portion of the paper that I mentioned that we published earlier this year, but I didn't have a, enough time to go into in 10 minutes, uh, actually talks about ways to expand the definition of service provided by a lithium ion cell, right? Then the traditional sense, when we're looking at the cost change of a lithium ion cell, we're saying the dollars per kilowatt hour stored or the dollars per watt hour stored. And so one thing we actually looked at that is what if we said the service provided by lithium ion cell is a function of not only how much it stores, but how effectively it stores it. Like for example, the energy density, because lithium ion technologies weren't adopted simply because they were the least expensive technology, but they were really energy dense cells. They allowed Sony to make a camcorder that you could hold in your hand. And so part of that work was actually seeing what happens to these measurements of the rate of change of a technology when you de expand the definition of service to include other characteristics. And so this is something that's widely recognized by battery researchers, that there are multiple characteristics that people would like from their energy storage technologies, including lifetime and fast charging. Um, and they're trying to optimize for as many of them as possible. And they're also going to change depending on the applications. Perfect. That definitely makes sense. I think I see a large push in charging efficiency and charging speeds in the electric vehicle space. That's why I asked that question. So it, it's, a, it's a great question. Thank you. Um, is there any questions from the audience? Feel free to join us on the podium. Yes, yeah. go ahead and ask your question. I have a, in your graph, there's one of the factor actually that's uh, uh, affect uh, negatively. Um, yes, um, let me yeah. just share that. I believe you're describing yeah. some kind of foil. Um, um, curious, what's uh, the reason? Uh, I believe you're looking at this plot, right? Yeah, there's yeah, there's yeah, there's yes. <laughs> so so yes, you're you're right. It's negative, which actually means the change in cathode foil area led to an increase in the price, or sorry, in the cost of lithium ion batteries when we define cost in terms of US dollars per watt hour, uh, which we've corrected for inflation and such. Um, and so what we're seeing here is that uh, we, over time, lithium ion cells have actually had increased areas. And this could be due in part to, for example, a desire to have a faster charge and discharge rate capability for those cells. And as a consequence, uh, you know, when you make when you put more foil in a cell, for example, you have less room for active material, which can then essentially increase the uh, pr the cost of the cell when you are essentially normalizing that scaling that cost by the energy of that cell of the energy capacity of that cell. Thank you. 
Perfect. Thank you for your question. We have one last question um, that was submitted via text from Sandy Rotter. Um, her question is, why is there a perception that lithium uh, lithium ion batteries improvement lagged behind photovoltaics? I can't really speak to as to why that perception exists. Um, and I can say that really what was available in the literature when we did a pretty uh, comprehensive survey of it is that there were some estimates that lithium ion batteries improved very quickly with learning rates of 30%. And then there were other estimates that they improved very, you know, slowly around 14%. Uh, and so I, I can't say for a, with any specificity as to why that perception existed. I don't know how universal it was, uh, but one thing we found is that in fact, it is a rapidly improving energy technology. The trends in price decline alone are, you know, pretty well explained by an exponential decline. Are pretty well modeled, I should say. Great. Awesome. Thank you for answering that question. Um, uh, there's another question from them that asks, what happened to the leakage current? The leakage current. Could you clarify as to what, what you mean by the leakage current? Sandy, can you clarify in the chat what you're referring to of leakage current? We'll wait for that response to come in. If, in, if you're referring to self-discharge, um, that's not something we considered in our analysis. Okay. Uh, I don't see Sandy in the chat. So um, we're going to assume that it is self-discharge for now. And um, with that, uh, we'll wrap up this question and answer session and the session in general. Um, so thank you again for all the presentations and thank you, uh, Micah, for your presentation. Um, if you have any questions for any of the presenters, in addition to what we got to today, feel free to reach out to them. Um, this is the last main presentation session for uh, the ISSD conference. There is one last um, group gathering called the Closing Happy Hour that is at 9 p.m. Eastern. Um, there's a happy hour Zoom link that you should have received via email if you'd like to join that. And uh, lastly, I'll just thank Megan, who is behind the scenes on IT today for helping everything move smoothly. So thank you all for attending the ISSD conference. Um, that's all for this session. And hopefully we see you all next year.